Hey, it's Rachel Carroll with the Neuromuscular Studio. I am um, taking advantage of uh, a little time that Eric has here on his break. Uh, this is Eric Christensen with uh, Chandler Physical Therapy. He's Doctor of Physical Therapy. Um, Chandler PT is one of our uh, go-to uh, PT clinics for our clients. Um, they do functional physical therapy, which basically treats the whole body and the whole chain of tissue um, in addition to traditional ortho um, PT. Um, and uh, works really well with neuromuscular therapy and uh, actually I've been working with your patients for time. Seven, seven years. years. Eight years yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so I wanted to um, take a little bit of his time. Thank you again. You're Appreciate it. Yeah, thank um, you. Wanted to take a little bit of his time to kind of talk with you guys about um, how we can help you with neck pain. So um, a lot of you now are working from home, which um, can be challenging in many regards, um, but Maybe your home ergonomic setup isn't like your professional desk setup um, at at their you know traditional right. uh, workplace. Um, you also may have kids at home, I'm guessing, because all those schools are closed. So you're navigating that. And we're also in a time of high stress. So we want to make sure that we are um, helping you with maybe some neck pain that's developing, giving you some tips and some tools to help you uh, have a little better experience at home um, now that we're finding ourselves in this situation. So anyway, without further ado, Eric, what do you have to say about all of that? Yes, we're, we're trying times we're in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, um, we're all going to get through this together. Okay? Yeah, so, you know, obviously we're, there's a lot of high stress right now. Um, and when we look at this natural stress response, whether that's from the incidents around us, maybe it's pain, maybe it's some combination of everything else, the body is going to tense the muscles that pull you into that fetal position, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. or less. Yep. Um, and so those are kind of common areas that we see either become painful or very restricted, leading to pain elsewhere. Um, couple that with a lot of us, like she was saying, we're working from home now, um, and probably not with the best desk setup. Even if you do have a good desk setup, we tend to navigate towards a more flexed crouched posture, um, which feeds more into that um, position, that fetal position as well. So um, the things that we want to kind of talk about in terms of ergonomics, you know, how your desk set up as best you can. Don't sit on the couch to do your work as at all possible. Um, and if it is there, set a timer and make sure it's not the majority of your day. I recommend at least every 30 minutes to a half hour, that is a half hour, uh, every hour, um, getting up and moving. At some level. So what we always recommend to our clients is uh, making sure you're setting either either a traditional egg timer, the you know old school egg timer, um, or a uh, timer on your phone. Right. Um, and make sure it's loud. Make sure you know that it you know you have to maybe put your phone across the room so that you actually have to physically get up to turn it off. Um, and then what we recommend is that they get up and they move around. They get the drink of water. You know they get their body moving, and then that's a good um, time to do some exercises and some stretches. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You gotta have that extra <laughs> cue because if you don't. You'd be like, oh, I'm going to stop in 20 minutes and three Zeus. hours later, Zeus. it's going to be, you know, like, why <laughs> yeah. am I dying with a headache right yeah. now? Yeah, so, for sure. Um, super important there. So um, do you want to jump into exercises now or you want to go over some tips on ergonomics? First? Um, let's do tips on ergonomics and then we can talk about the exercise. So ergonomics for the basics, you know, try and have something, some place where you sit where your hips and your torso are about 90 degrees. And I don't you know, something like sitting here so we're not super here and we're not really crouched up here as well. Um, make sure your feet can touch the ground. Don't let them dangle because if they're dangling, you're going to be using other things to support yourself like your hip flexors, which can lead to low back pain, neck pain, lots of other things. Right. Um, when we're sitting at the desk, try and be upright as possible. You know, we don't want to be hyperextended. That can be just equally as bad as slouching the whole time. Um, but something neutral where your ears go right over your hip bones is where we're looking for with that. If you can do something with a back support, whether that's like maybe a kitchen table chair, um, but maybe a pillow behind it, that might be optimal depending on, or if you have a lumbar support, you could certainly use that. Um, and then we want to look at about 90 degrees with the elbows here when we're on our keyboard, make sure the wrists aren't compact on something like that. Try and keep the wrists neutral as we're typing. Move that through there. Okay. Any other things to add with that? And then monitor height or laptop, you know, yeah. um, uh, position. If you can get to something where your laptop can be roughly about eye height or maybe about 10 to 20 degrees mm -hmm. below eye level would mm -hmm. probably be optimal. Um, some of them might have an external monitor, that docking station, not mm -hmm. everybody's gonna have that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're working on like a PC or a desktop type deal, mm -hmm. again, 
top of the monitor at eye level, so the monitor is slightly below eye level, okay. so we're not here. Right, right, because when you're here, what you're doing is you are actually compressing and tightening the suboccipital muscles, which are um, the muscles in the, the base of the skull um, that connect the base of the skull, the occiput, with the first and second vertebrae. Um, we have several pairs of them on both sides, and what they actually do is they have trigger point referrals that refer into kind of like a vice-like headache. So if you feel kind of like your head is just being squished with, um, with a headache, that's usually coming from suboccipitals, um, and then also, um, it, I mean, it can uh, compress the optic nerve, um, can influence migraines, all of those things just from simply having your head up in that position for an extended period of time. Definitely. A big headache area for us. We yeah. treat it yep. almost every day with yep. that sort of stuff. Yeah, we do too. So, <laughs> they, Unfortunately, yeah, but I mean, desks, there are solutions. Yeah, you know, desks are tough to come by maybe in your home office if you don't have it. Maybe if you are, you're working from home, hopefully you have something like that set up. But do your best not to be in any one given position for any long period of time. We, you know, it's kind of popular saying your, your best posture is your next posture. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't horrible if you're not here for two, three hours. Right. This is, can be horrible if you're here for two, three hours too. So, you know, be changing. And that's kind of what we're built as humans to do is to change position, not hold something steady. Our so, bodies are meant to move. Yes. For sure. 100%. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some exercises. Yes. What they can do at home. So um, if we look at those common muscles that are going to pull us into that fetal position, let's talk from that kind of standpoint okay. through there. Um, you okay being on the table? Sure. Let's do it. Let's pivot this over this way and see if we can't get this going. And let's go. Exciting. I get to be on the table today. <laughs> Go, um, maybe let's pivot so you're laying on your back if you can. Okay. And so when we are looking at the suboccipitals, like Rachel mentioned, they sit back here, kind of if you find them back here, you got a big old bump, it's called bump of knowledge. Um, on either side of that are the four little tiny muscles on either side called your suboccipitals. They're primarily meant to stabilize your skull on your spine. They're not big main movers, they're not supposed to be, um, but they also provide significant information about where our body is at in space, something we call proprioception. And if those are really gummed up, we might end up with either bad balance, could lead to maybe some vertigo-like symptoms, and significant headaches as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. Think of like a bowling ball, balancing a bowling ball on top of a broomstick. And so those are basically what your suboccipitals are responsible for doing is keeping that bowling ball on top of a broomstick as you know, you're moving through space. Right. So one of the easiest things that, that we can do is something we call a chin tuck. Um, and we can build on that for di very different things. But honestly, if you're just doing the chin tuck fairly frequently, that's gonna get you a long way down the road. So you wanna think that the back of your head is gonna stay in contact with that pillow. And in that position, draw your chin back as if you were to try and give yourself a double chin. It's not looking upwards, it's retracting in there. And as you come back into that, you're gonna get a nice pull along the back side of the neck back through here. Can you feel that? Mm -hmm. Do that. If you wanted a more aggressive stretch in this, you could certainly get rid of the pillow. It's gonna challenge the mid-back mobility a little bit more. Um, if this is too difficult, you feel like you can't do it, bring it up a little bit, maybe another small pillow underneath your head. Are there any precautions if somebody's had a cervical fusion? Um, it depends on where the cervical fusion is. Okay. Um, most of the time they're not fusing this area. Okay. So unless it's really recent, no. Okay. Um, but if it's uh, if you happen to have your C12 fused, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to be able to do this anyway. Correct. Um, okay. But if you're, if you're fresh out of surgery, obviously use your best discretion in any situation. This is just general advice. Sure. You've got to apply your own personal grade to that. Correct. With that. Normally with something like that, I recommend a 10 second hold, and I tend to recommend maybe going 10 reps, 15 reps, something like that. Now, if you're prone to headaches, you might start to feel a little bit of a headache come on, and that's very normal as long as when you back off, it backs off. If it's not, then we've hit a limit where our body's starting to react to the new stimulus, and we need to discontinue that. But if you feel a little pressure maybe behind the eyes or in the temples, like Rachel was saying, that's totally normal, but it should stop when you stop. And if it's not, we need to change something up. This is one of my favorite exercises. It feels fantastic. So. And if we want to take it the next step further, we could do that chin tuck just like you were doing, Rachel. And from there, keep the chin in, but slowly lift the back of the head about an inch or two up off that pillow. Good. Now keep that chin tucked as we slowly bring it back down. Don't lose that chin and then relax it back out. And that's going to challenge the front of the neck stabilizers a little bit more, um, but it's also going to do double duty and probably stretch the back side of the neck even a little bit more. Um, that can be more difficult and sometimes induce more headaches, so start with the first one, see if you get something. If you feel like you're not getting a lot out of it, move on to step two. Okay, cool. Um, you can sit for the next one, Rachel.
And in this position, uh, upper traps get very, very tight traditionally. Um, and so simple, easy stretch. We have two muscles kind of in this upper one. We've got the upper trap and then the levator scapulae. Mm -hmm. Rachel, who do you think is more of a, a guy that gives the problems, in your opinion? Um, levator for me. That's, that's I, I, I would put 97% yeah. of my money on that. Upper trap gets a lot of flack for it's not right. being its full. Right. Um, but we're going to stretch both of them. Let's, let's catch both with uh, one stone. Okay. The first one, if you can, take your arm kind of behind your back. It doesn't have to be as high as it goes. If that's an uncomfortable position, you can certainly just reach down and grab the edge of the seat that you're sitting on. Okay. It's just serving as an anchor. Okay. In that position, opposite hands come in on top. And then we're going to just going to gently pull away. So we're doing lateral flexion, bringing exactly. our ear towards our shoulder. Exactly. And as you do that, it should start to feel some oh, yeah. sort of pull through here. Oh, yeah. Um, my general rule, you can get really aggressive with this and really crank on your neck. Not necessary. Um, what we, I usually tend to recommend is 100% in max tolerance. We want to operate in that 50 to 70% range. And you always want to do both sides. Exactly. You don't want to be walking around in circles in the desert. Now, if they're at a computer and they're doing, um, you know, they're, they're right-handed with their mouse, is that something where um, we would want to do like a two-to-one ratio uh, between sides? Or should we just keep it one-to-one? -one I, or is that I kind of, because that could be day-to-day, -day, right? Sure. So yeah. sometimes I say if it feels tighter on one side, I'll spend a little extra time on that. Okay. I tend not to overthink it versus okay. sidewise. And I overthink because I'm a planner, so, you know, I'm tight yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if you feel like you need to do one more on the right, do one more on the right. If okay. you need to do two on the left, do two on the left. Okay, cool. Um, you want to do something like that, I'd recommend a 30-second hold. Okay. Two or three times on each side. All right. Don't like that. Okay. Now, pat yourself on your back. You've earned it. And then in that position, same idea, but a little different muscle. This is that levator muscle. So you're going to take that and pull it to the side till you start to feel a pull. And once you get that pull, then we want to go slightly downward towards the armpit. Mm -hmm. Should feel kind of maybe a little deeper underneath uh -huh. there. Yep. Um, with this one, if you just kind of look to the side and pull and combine it, I find a lot of people miss it. I like to do that two part to the side first, then slowly look down. For me, I feel like I get a lot more bang for my buck out Because of you're gonna isolate the muscle that way versus exactly. missing, yeah, somewhere exactly. in between. Okay. Um, and same thing, a couple sets of 30 second holds, both so. sides on that one. Now, this can be actually really good if you have a lot of shoulder pain too. Levator is pretty indicative in a lot mm -hmm. of different things in that regard. And those are super easy things that you can do pretty much anywhere right yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, you brought said yes. thing. Yes. Want to show them what you would do with that? Sure. Um, well, so for me, um, thinking about um, all the different things that we could do, um, one of the main things that I like to do with it that uh, relates to neck and shoulder pain is actually foam rolling lats. Okay. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a little hard for me to show on the floor, but what you would probably want to do. You should try it on the table if you want to. Try it on the table. Um, so this is actually a mini travel foam roller. Um, I actually got it um, from a supply company, but they do have it on Amazon as well. Um, and this fits really well into your suitcase, so you don't have to take a long foam roller um, when you travel. And um, it's in our branded colors with orange. Um, so what I want to do is show you the lat real quick. So the lat, you're going to be on the side, and you're going to put your foam roller on the side. Okay. And you're going to be stacked on your side and your arm extended out. And then I just like to do little rolls back and forth on kind of the belly of the muscle. And um, in all fairness, uh, the lat is probably one of the most sensitive muscles to foam roll. So give yourself grace. It, you know, if you can do it every other day, it's going to be fantastic. All you have to do are little tiny rolls, like maybe one or two inches, just to get a little bit of that fascia moving and to treat some of those trigger points. Um, I usually recommend that my clients do three different positions. So this is going to be your neutral position that gets the belly of the muscle. And then you can kind of re, um, position the roller more towards your um, shoulder blade. And then what you're going to do is you're going to roll forward but not in the armpit. You wanna be very careful to not be in the armpit. What you're looking for is that tendon attachment on the backside of, um, of the shoulder joint. And if you roll forward, you can get that. Um, that is probably the most sensitive area, but it's the most bang for your buck, okay? And then the last part is the, um, the flat version, because the lat actually goes all the way to the lumbar spine. Um, it's our lumbar stabilizer that connects the shoulder. So um, if you rotate back a few degrees, um, then you can kind of do some rolls on the flatter portion of that. Um, I don't recommend doing a lot of foam rolling on the lat, just a little bit, just enough 
um, to give you some movement. I should have done it before and then after, but just that little bit of work. And now I've got more movement in my shoulder and I have more movement. Um, more movement in your shoulder means there's less loading um, on your neck um, and into your, uh, your head. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, if you have a foam roll at home, you don't need the mini one, you could use any version of that. If it's too aggressive, we recommend maybe just folding a, a towel up over the top so you get a little cushion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you could drape your yoga mat if you got one over the top. Um, or you could use like a lacrosse ball mm -hmm. um, or a tennis ball. A lacrosse ball is going to be pretty aggressive. It's probably the most point tender, so proceed with caution there. That might be a progression. Yeah. You know, start with a regular foam roller and then, and then work your and way up. Kind of working your way up through yeah. there. And well, Amazon's... I'm pretty sure stock full of them, mm -hmm. you know, at least mm -hmm. the phone rolls. And then, then I want to, yeah, and I want to say something else about, um, so for me personally, um, I'm not, especially on the lat, I usually either do a smooth roller or one that has a, just a little bit of gritting. Um, I'm in the lat. I don't like to do what they call the rumble rollers or the ones that have the, um, the, the pegs or the, the texturing, um, on them. Um, remember that our ribs are movable. Um, and they're meant to move for breathing, which is gonna be our next thing that we talked about. Um, but our, our ribs are meant to move, right? And so we don't really wanna be putting a lot of knobby pressure um, on those ribs. Um, that would just be my one word of uh, precaution. Yeah, and I think if, with anything, it, the tool doesn't necessarily, it's that direct pressure, kind of sustained direct pressure, mm -hmm. slight oscillations that you're gonna get the best bang for your buck mm -hmm. with, you don't need what tool you use is up to you, but if it's too aggressive, if you're bracing yourself or having to hold your breath against it, you are missing the point. Yeah. And so you want to be able to ease into it. And at first it might be a little intense, but you should be able to adapt to that. If you're not adapting, we need to change the, the object of choice. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, and then the last thing that I kind of want to talk about, um, at least from my perspective, we'll see if there's anything else you want to sure. um, share, is breathing. Okay, when we are in times of stress, whether it is um, an environmental situation that we're all in right now, or um, you know, a deadline at work, or you know, frustration at home with um, with family members, whatnot. We tend to um, what they call a uh, ataxic breathe. So we tend to be breathing um, in layman's terms, breathing with our neck and not with our diaphragm and our abdomen, the way that our bodies were designed to breathe. Um, so that really plays. If people are stress breathing here, that obviously plays a, a part in pain um, for the neck and for headaches and, and shoulder tension. Um, what are some ways that people can learn to breathe efficiently um, and you know decrease the load? The yeah, neck? so uh, it, it does take a little bit of mindfulness. I think you got, this is something that you kind of stop and you have to think about, which is weird when you think about breathing, but um, it's hard to repattern breathing if you just think it's gonna naturally happen. It's mm -hmm. not like a muscle you can just stretch out. You do have to be a little more mindful about it. Mm -hmm. um, and. There's a couple different techniques I, I like to use. One is just, you know, kind of facilitating some belly breathing in general, diaphragmatic breathing, um, and then using that pattern to build into uh, paced breathing, and I, what I will call boxed breathing. Okay. There's lots of different names for it. Okay. You heard like four, seven, eight breathing, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then doing different long pauses, which we'll get into here in a second, but then also looking at kind of some forced exhalation breaths as a, a means to not only facilitate better diaphragm activation, but stress reduction as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so let's get you laying on your back. And so at home, hopefully you have a pillowcase or towel or something like that. And if we could have you kind of wrap this like a belt around your diaphragm. Okay. Sure. Uh, like I would say for that purpose, okay. yeah, where we got there. Um, and so in this position, I like to have at least the knees bent. If you can have some sort of bolster, a chair, pop your feet up on the couch, totally legal. Um, anything, because that's going to neutralize the spine. It's going to make it a little easier to tap into your diaphragm. This here gives you some cueing and a target to breathe into. Um, and for diaphragmatic breathing, I recommend going in through your nose, out through your nose if you can. Um, if you breathe in through your nose, it naturally facilitates more diaphragm activation. If you breathe in through your mouth, it's more chest in that upper breathing pattern. So if we can kind of facilitate slow down and use the nose, we might tap into it a little bit better. And so what I'm going to ask Rachel to do is take one hand and just kind of rest it on your upper chest. Um, in that hand, we should not see rise or fall. We want to deliberately do a more shallow breath than we normally do. So we're only getting it here. We're not getting it in the chest. And so Rachel, when you're ready, kind of deeply in through your nose, kind of slow and paced. If you feel all this around you, I want you to breathe into that pillowcase. And you're not trying to qualify for speed and time. Use the pace that feels right for you right now. Okay. 
And what a lot of people will do initially is they start breathing here, which is great, but they don't breathe here on either side. So what we want to think of is that the diaphragm wraps all the way around. So when you're breathing, breathe into here, but also try and expand the sides out at the same time. And that's difficult stuff. That's hard to do. Um, and you might find you're able to do one or the other, but not both. And you know, something's better than nothing, but working into trying to do it uh, at the same time is where we really want to start living. How difficult is that for you, Rachel? It, um, it, it's not difficult, but I'm having a really, I have to really think about, um, I start here and I have to remember not to have this engage and right. kick in. That's, that's the challenge for me in this if, exercise. If you watch Rachel breathe in quick, that almost automatically kicks in. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it has to be kind of a slow breath and that's, this is where it focuses. So doing it laying down, you could eventually get to sitting or standing with it, but laying down is gonna give you the best bang for your, your buck and easiest to do at least initially. So now that we've got that pattern down, we still wanna keep, keep in through the nose, out through the nose. You don't necessarily need to have a hand unless you like to do it. Okay. Um, but what we're gonna do is a paced breathing, a boxed breathing exercise. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna inhale for four seconds, pause for four seconds, Exhale for four seconds and pause for four seconds. Okay. Okay. And so again, at your own and that's pace, the box you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Okay. Um, and, and this is not a forced breath. It's not as most air you can get in. It's not the most air you can get out. It's just for four second breathing. And I'm still breathing through my nose the same in, way that I'm In through breathe. your nose, out through your nose. Yep. Okay. And we're trying to focus again on where that wrap is. And you don't okay. necessarily need this once you get it down. It's just nice to have. Okay. All right. And when you're ready, so we go okay. one, yeah. two, three, four, and then you're pausing. Three, two, one, out, four, three, two, one, and then pause. Three, two, one. Inhale again for four. Pause. Out. And what's nice about this, you can breathe normal, just don't stop doing it at all. Um, what's nice about this is that by pacing this, you're automatically slowing your breathing down. When we're in that chest kind of stressed breathing, we breathe probably double the amount we do in very small amounts. And so this forces the body to pace the breathing, which is naturally gonna tap into what we call our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and relax side. Um, and then it's gonna help decrease muscle tension. It's gonna help normalize blood acidity. So sometimes when we uh, hyperventilate, we actually end up with a state of respiratory alkalosis, which is basic blood, which can lead to nervousness, fidgeting, lots of different things, heightened uh, response sensitivity, things like that. Um, so pacing that, and that allows you, you know, if we're looking at 16 seconds, roughly you're getting three, three and a half breaths a minute rather than 10 to 20. Um, and that can have significant benefits for the nervous system. I like that. Yes. Um, building on that, so same kind of thought. We're going to breathe, pause, breathe, exhale, pause. Okay. Um, but now we're going to change the length of the pause. And okay. you can pause longer on the inhale, okay. or you can pause longer on the exhale. We're going to okay. do one of each. We're going to pause okay. long on the inhale. So same idea, in through your nose, out through your nose. Um, but let's inhale for four seconds. And then I want you to pause for eight And then exhale for four. And pause for four. Now inhale for four again. Pause for four this time. Exhale for four. Pause for eight. That exhale pause can sometimes be very tough. Did you find yourself struggling? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Your heart rate will kind of get like, that. oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first couple exhale long pauses might pick up a little bit of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So you might go six mm -hmm. seconds versus eight seconds. Okay. But you can build on that. Mm -hmm. um, the inhale pause usually isn't too bad. Okay. But the exhale pause, your body starts to go on. But what you, I don't know if you noticed when you took that breath in, mm -hmm. it kicks the diaphragm in almost. A yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, it's a good technique to have, but be use whatever intervals you think are most appropriate. Okay. You know, there's yep. no magic interval. It's whatever you naturally will do and mm -hmm. stick with. Okay, awesome. And then the last one is forced exhalation breathing. 
And for this one, you um, you might have heard of balloon breathing before. Yes. Um, you could use a balloon. You can use a straw. You could simply use pursed lips. Um, the goal is to provide a little resistance to the exhale. And this is the biggest breath you can take in and the biggest breath you can take push out. Okay. okay. So this one, I'll in through your nose, out through your mouth. Okay. Okay. So big breath in. I don't care if we get in the chest. We want diaphragm and chest. So okay. Big breath in. Big, big, big. And then through pursed lips, blow it all out. And you'll know when you get it out, because as you come down, these ribs are going to start to drop. And you're going to start to feel a quiver in anticipation. There's a little bit. Keep going. Keep going. There it is. One, two, three. Big breath in through your nose. Good. And then all of it out again. If you want, you can go a little quicker on the exhale. And there it is. Three, two, one, and then just breathe in one more. Woo! So that one is good <laughs> because we have something in our body called reciprocal inhibition. Right. So when we activate muscles on one side of the body that do one action, it inhibits or it turns off, relatively speaking, muscles that do the opposite action. So if I were to bend my arm, my tricep or bicep is on, my triceps are off. Mm -hmm. um, same concept here. If we're stuck inhaling more mm -hmm. because we're chest breathing, if we can forcibly exhale, mm -hmm. we turn those exhalers on a little bit more, we can decrease tension through mm -hmm. the neck. So, um, just, so just, just an observation after just doing that, um, uh, when I had my hip surgery, um, Eric was the uh, PT who uh, rehabbed me after my hip labrum surgery uh, four years ago. I'm still doing great, thank you. Um, but uh, uh, balloon breathing actually was crucial, um, a crucial part of my recovery because um, our diaphragm is so close to the psoas and so close to um, you know everything with pelvic floor and, and um, our pelvic bowl. Um, so he really worked with me on that um, and it definitely uh, sped up my recovery and my process and that, uh, that whole process. But just the, uh, laying here on the table with that, um, what I was able to notice immediately was that all of my spinal muscles, especially in kind of that mid thoracic and lumbar, um, just relaxed. I had a lot less tension in my lower back after I was done with the balloon breathing or the, um, the force breathing, yeah. um, which is amazing, right? Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's, it's, it's a good low level core activator. Mm -hmm. um, and when we have proper core activation, we get less hip flexor trying to substitute for that. Mm -hmm. We get less paraspinals trying mm -hmm. to substitute for it. So yeah. it's a great way to activate it. And you yeah. can do it pretty much anywhere. Yeah. yeah. In your car. I used to do it in my car all the time. So definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. All right. So um, any parting words, any last things you want to mention? Um, uh, wash your hands out there. Yeah. Um, stay safe out there. If you guys have questions, um, you certainly can reach out to us uh, and search Chandler Physical Therapy. Um, I know Rachel's going to be an excellent resource too. It seems like you're pretty well mm -hmm. active in that sort of community. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a website, breathebetter.co, if you want to learn more. I did write a book on the breathing. If you want to kind of dive deeper in that, you're more than welcome to do that. Which is there's really, really good. Kind of a self guided course there as well, if, if there's an interest that way or if you feel so inclined to. Uh, you know, hit us up, uh, find us on social media. I'm at Chandler Physical Therapy for pretty much everything. And send us a message. We'll try and troubleshoot as best as we can. Mm -hmm. And you guys are open Monday through Friday, right? Yep. As, okay. as it stands okay. currently, we are still open yep. And, yep. Uh, and operating, just taking, spacing our schedule out a little bit more, spacing the tables out a little bit more. Um, and then you, you do accept insurance and Medicare, but you also do cash pay sessions too, right? Correct. Yes. Um, and then how about dry needling? You also do um, dry needling? We do. Well? Yes, yeah. we do dry needling. Okay. Um, we, we have either a half hour or full hour session. Okay. Um, in any of those sessions, you can get dry needling in. Mm -hmm. um, we used to just call it a specific dry needling session, but some people wanted you know, some tissue work, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a you call it in terms of that situation. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we actually, um, if we have uh, clients that have stubborn trigger points that are not um, responding well to uh, more conservative measures with neuromuscular therapy, um, dry needling is one of the routes that we will uh, recommend. Um, we recommend that they see uh, Eric and his team over here for some dry needling just to kind of get a little bit more assertive in those um, so that we can make a little bit more progress. So we do work well uh, hand in hand together and uh, thank you for being an awesome resource. Thank you as well. Yeah, yeah. and it is, uh, today we are shooting on Friday um, and it is Bowtie Friday, bow tie Friday. Friday. PT Still for exists. seven years. It's been Bowtie Friday yeah. and um, yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. Super so. awesome. So anyway, so thank you for um, for watching today. We hope this has been a really great uh, experience for you. Um, over the next week or two, um, I'm going to be doing a, a few more uh, interviews with um, area experts um, just to give you more knowledge. You know, we're all we're all home. 
we're all in this together. Um, we want to make sure that we're still able to help you um, during this stressful time. And um, this is one way that we can help you. We have all this information in our brain um, that we like to, uh, to give to people um, when it's needed most. And so that's kind of what I'm doing with these uh, interviews. So thank you, Eric. Thank you. Have an awesome day and an awesome weekend. Make good choices out there. Absolutely, right? Okay, bye-bye.